purpose of this chat is probably just to um, um, get you to share a little bit about yourself, you know, your yeah. talents, your experience, um, love experience, so that um, you know, in order that um, uh, to inspire, you know, some of the younger, more generation, um, mm-hmm. so that share up more car, you know, that they will be um, willing to, um, I guess, um, you know, like. Uh, take ownership of our moon culture and preserve yeah. our, any, our heritage and you know culture and language like you. So I yeah. think this is this is the reason that I, I you know um, really want you to come on show and especially the moon in uh, in Australia here because we tend to um, lose the language now. The young people, right? Even my children, when they were little, they speak more. Yeah. But once they start school, that's it. You lost them. And now yeah. they're in the mid twenty or thirty, and then come back to learn more. So yeah. I think this is the um, this is the area that I thought that um, perhaps that you know our talk could shed some light on them. And then um, yeah, we'll um, we'll see whether you know anyone would um, would take ownership because in Australia here, yeah, I hate to say that um, it's very sad. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think, you know, I think um, as I debate, uh, discuss with other, you know, the and I, I always tell them that if you look at the narrative, most of the histories are, histories are written by the victor, right? Mm-hmm. And so usually uh, when they, when the victor write it, they always write uh, from the perspective of dominance, colonizer, mm-hmm. describing people that are not part of the, you know, not, not the colonizers as more primitive, mm-hmm. as more backward, as more barbaric. And so who wants to be a part of that, right? If that's how they dis- mm-hmm. describe you. And so in some sense, you kind of rebelled against those kind of narratives and you kind of rebelled against your community because you've, you've learned from mainstream uh, definitions of what is, uh, you know, what what is modernizations, right? <laughs> and so, uh, you know, if, if you're, and I think it's especially hard, particularly, you know, not, not, I don't know much about uh, the Australian educational system, but I know that like in the European nation, when you are, um, when you live in the country, you're expected to be assimilated into that country. There's no unique identity, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas in, and so you're supposed to be part of, but in America, you can have your own individual identity. And so we have a unique opportunity to preserve, to protect, uh, to advocate for uh, the teaching mm-hmm. of our language and culture. So it's much more different than I think the yeah, European model. Um, I think Australia probably similar to that, you know, it's, it's a multicultural um, country. So uh, once mm-hmm. you're in the country, and they're real, they really want you to preserve your own, you know, your own identity, mm-hmm. your own yeah. heritage. So it's just a lack of our young people that, um, like I said, you know, take ownership of the, um, mm-hmm. um, I call it root, you know, where they come yeah. from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, Professor Li Poixion, um, I think just, uh, before we begin, I think I just want you to perhaps um, take a little bit, probably a few back step, and then uh, probably share with us a little bit about, you know, your past and your, you know, um, your younger years so that people mm-hmm. will get to know who you are. Because I think now they know Professor um, Li Po Hyung as a professor, but they don't know before you get to, you know, this stage, right, how many obstacles mm-hmm. you have to, um, you know, overcome. And I thought that this is, the, this is a good opportunity. So um, where were you in 1975 when the, you know, when the Lao government's um, um, transitions took place? Sure. Let me let me start by you know I, I was born in Longjiang, and uh, so I pretty much lived with my father in Longjiang uh, until 1975. I was I lived with my father there because uh, so I could go to school, and uh, and then my mom and my other siblings live in uh, the Pusat, yeah, down Pusat, mm-hmm. and uh, so I lived with my father there and uh, pretty much grew up, explored the whole town of Longjiang. I probably know Long Gang like the back of my hands because so of, you're a Long Gang boy, right? <laughs> oh yeah, I'm a Long Gang boy. <laughs> and I was just talking to an individual yesterday, and I said, you know, I remember when the plane crashes, I was there. You know, when the T28 crashed into the jeep, I was there. When the uh, uh, Dakota airplane fell down to, uh, at the at the I would say at the end of the runway, I was there. And wow. uh, so, as a young person, I, I pretty much. Ex- 
explore that that town was mined to be explored. And then in 1970, on May 19th. Uh, uh, 76, uh, when the, during the evacuation of Long King, we were fortunate to have gotten on the plane, one of the plane out of... So you were actually was one of the person then who went to the, uh, the, those big, like, you know, the door, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we heard about the evacuation on May 12. And so we heard about the evacuation. Of course, the evacuation of Long King started in, on May 9th already. And on the 9th, they started to evacuate all of the military officers, their families, and they were transporting them to Thailand. And then uh, May 12th was the kind of like the official evacuation of, of Long Gang. And so you have a C-46, a C-47, and a, and, and a C-130 that came to evacuate people out of Long Gang. And so um, the 12th, we heard about it. And so we went and picked up my grandma, grandpa, uh, and my, my mom and my siblings from Tokusan, uh, Pekusa Mountain, and drove them to Long Gang. And so we stayed there, and then on the 13th, we went to the airport uh, to try to catch one of those flights out of uh, out of Laos. And so we fought, fought, and then uh, couldn't get on the plane. And then um, uh, there was a plane that the C-46 landed, and they said, move back, move back. This is for Colonel, Colonel Sandang Xiong uh, and his family. And so my dad said, if that's for Colonel Sandang Xiong, we're going. And so we rushed and he pushed uh, my mom, my brother and myself and, and another brother into the plane. And uh, so we got on the plane, we flew out of there. And the pilot who, who flew that, who piloted that plane, his name is Les Strauss and he still lives in Bangkok. And so each time I travel to Thailand, I always make it a point to I, visit. I have yeah. goosebumps. You were listening to me. <laughs> so can I yeah. ask, how, how, old, and how old were you uh, back then? And that? You know, I think I must have been like eight or nine years old. Eight, probably eight years old, right? Eight years old. And so okay. we got on the plane. And I remember it was all packed. And uh, when we arrived in Nam Pong, uh, and this was like probably in the afternoon, probably about three o'clock yeah. that we got on the plane because there were other planes that came but we couldn't get on. And so um, around three o'clock, we got on the plane. When we arrived in Nampal, it was kind of dark already, six o'clock. Uh, we stepped off the plane and we looked around. We couldn't find my mom. I mean, we couldn't find my dad. Uh, we couldn't find my grandma, grandpa, and uncle. And oh, uncle. they weren't in the, the, the plane. <laughs> they, they didn't. They couldn't get in. <laughs> the, the plane was too packed. And so I remember waiting at the airport with my mom for the planes to land to see if my dad was stepped off. And finally, at 9 o'clock at night, uh, my dad actually stepped off the, the C-130. And uh, so that was uh, quite a relief. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, again, uh, for some reason, you know, food brings back memories, right? And so when we landed in, in Nam Pong, uh, the food there was quite good. Um, so each time I eat curry, <laughs> It reminds me of Nam Pong. <laughs> because I, that's, that's I, I suppose that, that it's, uh, um, it's the food that is for the, um, I think, the VIP, isn't it? Because those, those plans oh. for the VIP. <laughs> Probably. You know, and, you know, it's kind of interesting. We, we have here at the Center for Hmong Studies a uh, the, uh, Jerry Daniels collection. Jerry Daniels was the person mm -hmm. assigned, uh, the CIA person assigned to work with Jerome Powell in the Hmong. And so I was going through all of the documents and I saw all these receipts, all these withdrawals of money. And I'm like, you know, wait a minute, you know, we, we were living poorly in Nampong, but how come all these money were being withdrawn by General Wong Pao? And they're in the thousands, right? Tens of thousands of dollars. And later on, when I interviewed some of the elders, uh, some of the people who work closely with General Wong Pao, I learned that when the Hmong arrived in Nampong, there was not a refugee program. And so there was no way to feed the refugees there. So General Wang Pao actually used his money mm -hmm. and took used some of the money. We drew some of the money from the CIA to buy food for the refugees in uh, Nam Pong. So that's why I think I think it's really important, even the work that I do here. You know, one thing is to hear stories, one thing to see document, but it's important to combine the stories and the document together to uh, to see the holistic picture, right? Really um, actually, I'm glad that you brought that um, subject up because I think uh, it has been a controversial reason for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. They thought that, you know, a lot of things that um, have 
like I said to a lot of people, a lot of things that have done behind the scenes and it's for the good cause. But yeah, you know, yeah. we are in the front people, we always see that, you know, these people, you know, or this money or this, um, the, how the, um, um, you know, practice is so different. But um, mm-hmm. in reality, you know, a lot of things that, you know, they, they, they just don't, it's not necessary for everyone to know, isn't it? Like yeah, said. that's that's right. I think that there's a lot of things behind the scene. I mean, I hear people criticize about the lack of leadership within the Hmong community, you know, in the camps and the refugee camps. And I said, you know, there was great organization. There was great leadership, mm-hmm. all right? I mean, you have thousands of people converging into an area. How are you going to find food for them? How are you going to find lodging for them? And, and you know, I still applaud, I applaud many of these key military leaders mm-hmm. who are Stepping up to the plate and, and really organizing everybody, found housing for all of us and um, and food for all the refugees <laughs> yeah, <laughs> during that during a period of time. You know. I, I grew up with, in this era too, and like um, even to I think I'm, I'm a little bit older than you, but um, you know the the thing here because I'm sort of happening in the family, and you know, even though that child is speaking, but you know you are. You're behind that, and you tend to hear what they they say. That that's a lot of things happen, you know, behind the scenes. Then, yeah, and then no no one's is bothered to to check the um you know the um the record before they um make, make the assumption. Problem. Yeah, assumption. <laughs> I think this yeah. more the more manatee, isn't it? Good night, that yeah. you're already hearing though. You know that the lupa yeah. you and it's it's very um. This is something that, you know, <laughs> I thought that um, would be a very negative um, portrait of the moon. <laughs> it, it, it is. I think it's, you know, it, it is important to, you know, e- at each level, right? I mean, people have information that are shared at differently at each level, right? Mm-hmm. And so you are afforded with the information at your level. And at the next level, they have their own information. And uh, so it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that we check all the sources, right, mm-hmm. at, at all of the level. Because there's always a truth at, uh, in, in each of the story, okay, mm-hmm. elements of truth in each story. Exactly. But as, as scholars and as researchers, it is our responsibility to listen to all of them and, and then to present. And this is how I, I teach my students. I have all, I put all of these information, I present it to them, and I say, what do you think? Make your own decisions based on the information and the facts that's presented in front of you. Right. So I think that that's, that's, that's my motivation to collect some of these things. I mean, even Jerry Daniels' uh, uh, boxes of materials, the, there's the list of, uh, the list that uh, General Von Paul provided to Jerry Daniel to be evacuated, right? And these are all key military yeah. leaders. And so we have a lot of important, you know, documents here, uh, but it, it's, Im- it's important to preserve these things because they're all part of our history. We, we will go back and talk a little bit about all the information, but um, mm-hmm. so how long were, were you in the camp? You know, we, we, we were the first 100 families to move from uh, Nampong to Babina refugee camp. Right. And so my family uh, moved to, uh, was transported to Bavina Bavuchi camp mm-hmm. in January of 1976. So we lived in uh, uh, Bavina Bavuchi camp until 1970, let's see, October 22nd, 1976. We were sponsored by a Mennonite family, a Mennonite church in Indiana. Mm-hmm. And so we came to the United States and on October 22nd, 1976. So you probably want to burst a second wave of refugee Probably, yeah, probably the, the second wave, the second wave, the second wave. Um, our name came up a couple of times, uh, and, uh, but we didn't. The father, um, <laughs> just like our case. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't want to come because, you know, uh, we, our family was separated from my grandparents. And so uh, to leave them behind, you know, that, that was not something that my dad was willing to do. But eventually, you know, we had an uncle that came uh, ahead because the, he works for the four air control guy people. And, um, and so, and so uh, during the resettlement, early, early resettlement, there were three criteria that were set up. The first criteria is that you must have, uh, you must have families in the United States. So very few people. Second criteria and category was that you must have worked directly with the Americans, like CIA, USID. And the third category would be that you are, a, a, 
that you are a soldier, right? You are a soldier. If you were to return back to Laos, you'd be persecuted. Mm -hmm. So most of the Hmong people qualify under category number three as soldiers. Uh, and so, but my uncle, uh, who you know, uh, who came here uh, earlier, he qualified for that one of those cat the earlier categories where he worked directly with the Americans. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's those those are the criteria. And so that's why when my uncle was here. I came here, you know, we've qualified for two criteria. One criteria that he worked for the, that, we, uh, that uh, my father was in the military. And the other criteria was that we have family members in America. Was it a so, difficult decision for your father to leave the country at that time? I think it was, it was very difficult. But, you know, at the same time, my father knew that because he was uh, in the military, you know, to stay behind would be dangerous, right, for him and the family. And so I think it was very difficult for him. And it was difficult for, you know, for my grandparents to leave too. My grandparents didn't want to come. And I remember my dad, you know, we, we went, we came halfway. And then my dad decided, no, we got to go back and force them to come with us. And so they went back and forced my grandparents and my aunt and uncle to get in the car with us and to come back to Long Gang. And uh, so I think that, I think for, that that's difficult, right? And so my dad knew that because he was uh, part of the heavy artillery unit uh Polona and he had nine more more itia nine more itia uh you know more e compan itia and so he knew that he was um, sorry, was and and cái tiếng bê hô cho nó xong khoa xong nó nè xong khoa xong yeah you were xong khoa xong nó nè tao luôn bê lo cho hô khoa and so he was he was stationed in long gang he was you know dog a thai he was trained in thailand came back Station. Uh, he was where all the major conflict in Laos. He was there, and so Nyabin Balong Lo, Thoihan Lo, all of the place Long Gang, uh, and uh, I had the luxury. I mean, when Jai I had the luxury of spending time with him. I mean, I remember flying to. I flew to Long Gang uh, to be uh, to to Mun Cha to be with him when he was training over there. Yeah. I think that that's that's very good, isn't it? To have someone that who is high in that um and, you know, to have the first-hand information, then you can learn from that. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think, you know, being being a war child, you know, you learn a lot, you've seen exactly. a lot. Um, yeah, I've seen a yeah. lot more than I need to. <laughs> now let's move, move to your, your profession. Oh, no, I think before that, probably uh, you are you are schooling in uh, in the U.S. So you went there and you did all your, I suppose, your secondary um, schooling. Uh, yeah, when, when we arrived in, in the United States, uh, I started up in the fourth grade, and uh, so in Indiana. And then we moved to Minnesota in 1979, and so started in the sixth grade. So I did all of my education here, um, high school here. I remember in high school, my, uh, you know, my our parents always encouraged us to go to college. You know, they, they've never been to college. They don't know what it's like to be in college, but they always encouraged us to go to college. And so I went in to see my uh, high school counselor and I said, I want to go to college. And my high school counselor told me that I was not college material. And <laughs> I what, should just what, go to technical, I should just go, I should just go to technical school. And that's what he told me. And uh, so, but I, I said, you know, hey, I'm going to apply. So I applied to the University of Minnesota. I applied to community college, I applied to Concordia here. And I was accepted here at Concordia. I came here. And then the University of Minnesota uh, wrote back and said, I've been accepted to the University of Minnesota. And so as a person, as a young person coming from a poor family, um, I looked at the financial aid package. Uh, here at Concordia, after I pay off all my, uh, after I, I pay off my tuition with loans and everything, I still have $500 left over to pay out of pocket. At the University of Minnesota, <laughs> so I paid off everything. I still have two thousand dollars left per semester. So, <laughs> so obviously, I said I'm going to the University of Minnesota. So that's what I went to the University of Minnesota, and actually got my bachelor's degree uh, in political science at the University of Minnesota. But I wanted to go to the University of Minnesota to go into business because in high school I was always listening to shortwave radio and to international broadcasts from throughout the world. I mean, I was listening to, you know, the Voice of Free China out of uh, out of Okeechobee, Florida, transmitting on behalf of Taiwan. Uh, I was listening to that Voice of America. So I was listening to broadcasts out of the world and I wanted to travel. I wanted to travel. So I said, the best way for me to do that is to go into business. 
Uh, and so my intention of going to the University of Minnesota was really to go into the business school. But I graduated differently. <laughs> I graduated later in political science. And I, that, that gets into, you know. That's uh, what I was going to ask you. You know, it's just totally different, you know, uh, faculty is different <laughs> from from what you, you have passion. Because like you said, you want to go yeah. now, but then you end up with political <laughs> Yeah, I, I think one. I think one of the things that changed my mind was that during the summer of, of 1988, I had an opportunity to go to Washington D.C. to work for a United States senator, and uh -huh. so I went to Washington D.C. and I was the only Hmong in Washington D.C. in 1988, only Hmong person working in Capitol Hill, and so I was working with uh, United States Senator Carl Levin, and some of my uh, case files includes Nelson Mandela. Uh, at that time, Nelson Mandela was still locked up. And so I, my job was to write on behalf of the United States Senator to the South African government to ask the South African government to, uh, to basically free Nelson Mandela and also to write letters to, you know, some of the major multi-million dollar corporations like Coca-Cola and others to boycott the South African government. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of those things uh, for the, on behalf of the United States Senator. And then, uh, uh, but at the same time, like I said, you know, I, I was very close to the Senator. I was the one that brought him uh, lunch every single day. And so <laughs> when he was in committee, yeah, yeah. I brought him lunch. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the day, since he was the chair of Veterans and Military Affairs, every day I was bringing confidential document to the Secretary of Defense at the Pentagon. You know, so I was thinking, here we are, you know, here I am, the nation's capital, the greatest country and the most powerful country in the world. How come... I don't see any more people. I think right? you, are, you, are, you are destiny. To the yeah, I was, um, and so I think that that kind of woke me up, and I said, "Okay, I'm the only Hmong here in Washington D.C. on Capitol Hill," and so that's why when I came back, I wrote to all of the state uh, uh, representative here in Minnesota. And I said, I would love to learn more about politics, and I'd love to learn more uh, about the inner working of government. So I will be willing to volunteer my time to come and work for you free of charge. I think the word is volunteer, isn't it? They volunteer. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let's, um, I know that um, when I read to you a bio, you know, mm -hmm. um, a bit of information, a bit of there and here, and looking for, you know, my goodness, I was thinking to myself, my goodness, how, how can you find time to fit all <laughs> this, you're sitting on this board, that board, you're doing this and that. Yeah. How do you find time to do all this thing? How, you know, I, 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 yeah. I, I, think, I think one of the thing is that, you know, you, you have to be passionate about it, right? Be passionate about the work that you do. Mm -hmm. And my, my philosophy is, uh, is that if you have a skill set and you have the ability to, and you, if you have the skill set, use that skill set to advance your community, right? To advance your community, to right. your community. Um, and so that's why, like I said, you know, when I came back, I wrote and I, I worked free for the United States, uh, for State Senator Joe Bertram on veterans issues. And then later on, they hired me as a leg legislative assistant. And then after I worked a little bit, I said, you know, I want to go back to the community. I want to be able to help the community. And mm -hmm. so that's why I went back and worked for the Hmong Youth Association. I mean, what, I started working with them. that because of the, the Hmong that's a, that inspire you to to do all these things? I, I think that one of the things that is, is, I think what inspired me is you don't see uh, the face in power, in, in the office of power, right? Where all of the decisions are made, policy decisions are made that mm -hmm. impact every single day. And they go, I can't change it. You have to be on the top, isn't it? Too? Yeah. You, you, yeah, because you don't, you don't see the community understanding and knowing how to access those resources and those right. services and opportunities. So you have to so be I've, policy, I've been through that. Yeah, yeah. Policy, uh, what is what you call the policy plan? Yeah, but uh, yeah, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the political spectrum. And so it's, it's important to understand, to, to know, many, not many people know, right? I mean, many people go to school, graduate, but they have not been inside the system. What they, they have been graduate, like what they, they study, isn't it? That's right. But the thing is that they've not been on the inside. Mm 
yes. to understand, you know, like they said, uh, you want to be you, you want to be in the room where the sausage are being made, exactly. right? Where the cakes is being baked, instead of just being out in the cafeteria just consume the material. Yeah. So for me, I mean, just being in there, not seeing when I came back and worked at the Minnesota State Legislature at the Capitol uh, in eighty eight, also eight eight eighty nine. I was the only Hmong person over there as well. You know, so wherever I go, so all the Hmong person, the only Hmong person. So, but I came back and I worked at the youth counselor and then I worked, uh, uh, the opportunity presents itself to be the executive director of Hmong Youth Association. I said, okay, I'm going for that. And uh, so did that uh, and uh, look at ways on how to discourage young people from marrying so young, marrying so early. I saw some of my students uh, that I was working with uh, getting married very early. Many of them didn't know what they want to do in life. They don't have career aspirations. Um, and so I started to, you know, again, create employment programs for the young people, started to have mentorship program for girls uh, so that the girls would have access to you know, opportunities and just not just become a wife, but to become somebody, Money. to become yes. professional, right? And uh, so there's a lot of variety of uh, jobs and opportunities for girls, for women. And so we started to develop those programs. Uh, and then we have a lot of young people getting involved in trouble. Good time. Joining well, that is excellent. Yeah. It's an excellent time. You are you a person with that vision, isn't it? You, you, you. Yeah. Um, you plan so you know so much for the younger generation. Now I'm going to uh, given that you have a lot of experience or like expertise <laughs> in political education or in education. I think I would say a lot. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've just been fortunate. I just that's fortunate. right. And I share um share with us a little bit about your leadership style. Mm-hmm. Like perhaps and you know um probably share, share with, I think this, this will benefit the younger generation. Mm-hmm. What are the essential quality that a great leader require or must have in today's world? Yeah, yeah. I, I would say, I would quote um, the, um, the, the previous CEO of uh, Medtronic, right? He said you need to have passion, right? And so you, you need to find uh, something that you feel passionate about, right? And then once you find that passion, you have to be humble about it, right? You have got to be humble for the opportunities to work with people. And then you have to also be, uh, I would say, uh, have compassion for the people that you work with. And I think too often we have many leaders, you know, they, they are in a position. They think that a position brings power. I always tell people, you know, when I left the state, you know, to go to all these positions, they said, those positions are so powerful. I said, it's not the positions that make you powerful. It's what you do with the position that makes you powerful, right? (laughs) And so if you feel passionate about the community, you see uh, they're suffering within the community, how do you use your position to elevate the community and to lift the community up, right? And so for me, a passion of mine is, is really to to see the community transform, to see the community better than uh, it was before, right? And so always looking at th- those opportunities and those obstacles, then you try to build capacity. You build capacity within the community so they can move up, right? And so, but at the same time, I think that, you know, being uh, uh, being compassionate in working with people, you know? So for one of the things that, you know, I, I remember when I was at Momok Apprenticeship and, um, <clears throat> I came out and just sat in the in in the waiting area, and uh, people would say, "Who are you?" And I say, "I'm Li Bao Xiong." It's like, "What, Li Bao, the director? You know, what are you sitting out here? I'm sitting out here interacting with you, right?" And so normally people say, "Well, you're the director. You should be in your office only, right?" Or I go, I I have lunch with my staff. You know, I come out and I have lunch with my staff, have conversation with them, because I think I see everybody, I, I you know, I see everybody as you know, working together in partnership. It's a team. It's a team. Yeah, it's a team. It's a team. It's a teamwork effort. And so if you think that you're alone, you think that you're the only one that's doing all this work and you neglect your, your employee, you know, oftentimes 
people leave jobs not because of the job. They leave job because of the supervisor. <laughs> and so they leave the job, they quit their job because of the supervisor. So for me, I'm always doing that here at Concordia. I interact with young people. I interact with the, 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 and because you you have to go in, like I told my staff before, when you go into the meeting being arrogant and not being humble about the opportunity and you think that you know it all, you're going to leave the meeting not knowing anything. But if you go in to say, you know what, I'm going to go in with an open mind and uh, to listen and to learn, you're going to leave that meeting learning something uh, and so that's always been my just by philosophy I think over time uh, I've uh, interact with many many leaders who taught me many things and I think that that's that's always been part of um, who I am and what I do uh, one time uh, Lisa the guitar player <laughs> the famous guitar band player you know, he said Deepao I've been following your your career and I noticed something about you you're consistent with it, of course, you have to be consistent in your leadership, right? Like you have to have, you have to know your true north. You have to have moral values, right? And uh, and so these things are these are things that guide you. You have to have passion, and when you do, talk talk what you do, talk share what I am, okay? Talk share talk what a Jisalamu Kateng Katsi, that's why you know see everybody as the teacher. Do you feel that? Um, do you feel that now uh, our young people, uh, they um, they appear to be too confident? Yeah, I think this is uh, Stephen Covey once said this. Um, many people think that they're wise. Jane, I mean, Jane and yeah, many people think that they're wise. And Steve, Stephen Covey is uh, another guru in in leadership, and it, uh, he said people think they're wise, but you know what they don't understand is that. Knowledge comes from learning, okay? And then experience comes from doing, okay? And so many of the young people come out uh, graduating with degrees, you know, bachelor, master, PhD. They think they know it all, right? They think they know it all. And, and uh, so they look down upon the elders who are experienced. Mm-hmm. And then the elders, on the other hand, say, That's <laughs> my what really what the law on the so you need the two together in order to put in jet down that. So those that graduate with the degree, they don't interact, they're not humble enough to interact with, with the, the people who are experienced, then their learning won't, I mean, just like most people say, that yeah, they chi. Uh, okay? And the way that you sharpen your knife is basically to interact in the community. And I think too often we have many people uh, who would have difficulty in transitioning from uh, institutions to community, right? Institutions. I um, I love what you, I think I was reading about you and I love what um. I think you said something about when you graduate and um, Dr. Yang Dao says something to you. Can you, can you, um, you know, share that with us? What did he say? Sure, yeah. You know, Dr. Yang Dao was my uh, economic advisor at the University of Minnesota when I was doing my undergraduate work there. So after our, we graduated from a uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Minnesota, he came and gave a speech. And he said, Nick, uh, a bachelor's degree that we got it. So you have your, now you have obtained your bachelor's degree uh, in mainstream society, go back to the community to earn your high school diploma. <laughs> and if you don't, this and if you don't powerful, earn your, isn't it? This is a very powerful. It is. It is very powerful. It's still always in my mind. I mean, it's always ingrained in my mind. Yeah. When, yeah. when, I, when I read that and I, and I came across that, I thought, this is this is very powerful. This is we need to, uh, you know, we need to. Um, tell our young people because once they graduate, they said, "Oh, you know, I'm graduate." Um, that's it, you know. I'm gonna yeah. go to the community, and then you know, because they they all like you saying, they have never been to um, the system, um, the education system, so they they kind of don't know. But I'm I'm up there. But like you said, yeah. the sum up really sum up. Yeah, you you really yeah you really do need to go and learn from the community, apply your knowledge in the community, right? Test it out in the community. Don't just come out and 
use Western knowledge on the community, right? Because the community, we are a collective society. Mainstream America is an individualistic society. The Western society is an individualistic society. But in the Asian Pacific community, I would say, you know, we are a collective society where it's important for us to interact with each other, to help each other, to be involved with each other, and to help everybody succeed, right? And so using, I would say, using theories in mainstream America and trying to use that within the Hmong community, it's like apples and orange. Uh, and so you have to be able to blend the two together to, to really make your learning much more meaningful and much more useful and much more effective uh, in, in moving the community forward. I see a lot of bright young people graduated, come back to the community, but they're not accepted in the community because of the, the way they talk, right? Mm -hmm. The way they uh, portray themselves. Uh, and I always, you know, uh, say, people invite me to go and do commencement speech, to go uh, graduation speech. And I often say, well, what about this person, that person, that person? And they say, well, they are different from you. And we want you. <laughs> and I say, well, those people are very educated. You can talk to them. But I think one of the differences, uh, John McKnight, a sociologist, uh, once said, uh, we have to know how to trans uh, transform the language of institutions to the language of community, yeah. right? Uh -huh. And yeah. so if you only use the language of institution, then the community won't understand and won't be, you won't be able to apply to the community and they won't have a buy-in. And so it's gonna be very difficult for you. Mm -hmm. So I see a lot of people, they go in the community, they do like, they use language of institution, academic language, and they say that that's not relevant to us, right? But how do you transform that? How do you change that into, language of institutions so that they would understand. And I think that that's what, you know, when we started the International Conference among Studies here, we uh, did, uh, we gave out a uh, Eagles Award to scholars. And Dr. Gary is one of the individuals that received, was the first person to receive the Eagles Award. And the reason we gave the Eagles Award is that, okay, it's great, you produce all of these uh, reports, all of these research, how are you going to apply that to the community? How will the community use your research to help the community advance? And how are you helping them to do that, right? And so Dr. Gillies have been able to do that. And so we gave him an award for that. And so, I, I, you know, just to really, to motivate scholars to be much more engaged and involved in the community and not just from an academic institution perspective. So, so I think that that's, you know, along the line of what Dr. Uh, Youngdao said uh, back then, uh, that, you know, you have your bachelor's degrees, but go to the community and earn your high school diploma in order for you to be able to use your degree much more effective in the community. Do you think that they understand that? I, I think that, Yes and no. I think some some uh, some people some do understand it. Some have a difficulty in understanding. <laughs> no, no. This, you this, have to be, like I, like 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 I said, you have to be humble, right? You have to be humble enough when you go into the community. You have to go in with the mindset, just like I told my staff. You got to go in with the mindset of a clean slate, right? You know, That's this, like um, this 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 um, phrase is um, remind me back when you know when I was asking you about the book and you said that um the the book the, your your latest book is about the speech that changed the world. I think yeah. this, this is this is what isn't it the line that will change the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's you so, you have to so powerful. Yeah, it is. It is very powerful, and I think that again, I, I've been fortunate to be around many of these, you know. Uh, influencer, right? People who are key leaders who've been in the community, been active. And so as I look at even the pool of um, Hmong scholars, right? We have about four or five hundred, I, I would call it people with Ds, right? Behind their names. <laughs> right. Not, yeah, people with Ds behind their name, they're JDs, MDs, PhDs, uh, right? right? <laughs> and so uh, n not many we can use in the community, right? Not many, not many we can use in the community. And the ones that, and I think the ones that were able, that they were able to be usable by the community are the ones that have 
life experiences or much older. That's and so right. they're able to do that. But the, those who are just, you know, those are much more difficult uh, for them to be. I, um, yeah, I'm going to ask you about your uh, current role, but I think we probably touch yeah. a lot about your, um, well, you know, the more program at um, mm-hmm. uh, Concordia is in the university. Mm-hmm. And you already mentioned, you know, the, um, why you're starting this program. Mm-hmm. Now, probably, you know, when you're looking at the um, running this, would you looking at running this similar program in other university mm-hmm. or um, perhaps like off an online, online, you know, learning so that, mm-hmm. um, for example, if people, the more people in Australia, they want to take the mm-hmm. course and they want to learn so they're able to join. Yeah, you know, we... I've not really launched an online program yet until this this year with the pandemic and we start to teach online, <laughs> teach online. But I think one of the one of the things unique about the center here, right? We're still the only center for most study in the world, and we launched the yeah, and we launched the first minor in the United States, a minor in Hmong studies in the United States. And so, I want to ask you, minor in Hmong? What can you learn about Hmong? Yeah, I think that you know when you go when you go to college, you declare a major and a minor, right? So the major is what you focus all of your attention on. Minor is something that you will it's less fewer credits, like twenty four credits only, and so you can take a series of course. And once you fill these courses, then you will give you a minor, right? So it enhances your main degrees. So most of my the students in in that declare or graduated with a minor in studies, they uh, they graduated with a bachelor degree in education, in social work, in psychology, in business, and others, right? And so these are the people that say, you know, I want to emphasize, I want to learn more about the Hmong, and I want to say, a minor. My speciali- yeah, my specialization is also Hmong, right? And so I think we we are probably the only institutions that focused per, for the whole semester, a course on Hmong history, right? And so Dr. Gailey uh, was brought here in 2006 uh, to help us uh, craft this. Uh, and so he came here as a scholar in residence and he helped us develop these courses. And so we have a couple of courses, you know, one is uh, Introduction to Hmong Studies. And so using post-colonialism theories to, to look at post-colonialism theories basically something that's beyond uh, colonization, right? And so uh, uh, looking at how people are studying the Hmong and how are the Hmong defining themselves, right? How do we define ourselves versus the top-down approach of people saying, we think you are like this, but the Hmong really say, no, we're not really like that. We're like this, right? And, and also finding out who's doing major research work within the Hmong community. The second course is Introduction to Hmong History. So we talk about Hmong history from China 5,000 years to now, to currently now, right? So one of the things that we focused on, you know, again, uh, with, with Asian hate, right? We talked about the history and how that affects the Hmong community. Uh, and so the introduction of Hmong history and then Hmong culture and society, uh, where you talk about the important aspect of Hmong culture, right? For Hmong people, three or four key events are key for the Hmong community. One is birth, right? The other is marriage and death, right? And then you culminate into the the New Year celebration. So these are the four, four major things that uh, uh, that that the Hmong people are, are that are important for the Hmong community, that are important for the Hmong community. So we talk about, you know, here we, we, we teach the why. Why do we do this? Why do we have elaborate... Uh, wedding ceremonies, right? Why do we have uh, elaborate uh, funeral ceremonies? And so you talk about the why instead of the how. If people want to learn how to be Ito Mekong, how to be Ito Kitai, we send them to the Hmong Culture Center <laughs> where they teach those things, right? And so I think that that's, uh, so we have that course, the Hmong Literature and Art. I mean, we have and and how that also have changed with some of the current Hmong music nowadays, right? And so we do, we teach about those things, we talk about those things in the language. And so our, our I would say our minor is very comprehensive and it's a semester long. Uh, whereas, you know, for other places that I've seen, 
they talked about only maybe a, spending a, a week to talk about it and then everything else, you know. And so I think it's important uh, for our young people, and which is, you know, uh, based on the evaluations, young people found it very helpful in that uh, they didn't know the why. You know, I see it every day. I just don't understand, right? I don't understand why we are we doing it. I see it every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so I think so those are things that are important for the young people to understand. Once they know, then they appreciate, right? So uh, it's transformative knowledge, I think. So um so who actually um, teaching them? I teach I teach all of them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, I, I always tell uh, I tell my, my dean here that They, they want me to teach political science in American government, and I've been teaching that as well. So I've, I told them before, I said, you, you're not hiring anybody else to teach these things, right? The, the, the most studies course. Uh, so I have no choice but to teach it because we already have a minor in most studies. So it would be unfair for the most students and for non most students who declare a minor to not continue to offer the courses, right? It's easy for you to find the mainstream people to come and teach political science in American government. So you can find that, you can you can go ahead and do that. Let me focus on here because my background is politics, right? My background is politics, political science, public administration. Because I, you know, when I did my, uh, after a bachelor degree, I went to do my public administration degree, master's and then my doctorate. And so uh, it, it's all in the politics arena. My background is all politics, been working on policy stuff. Uh, and so uh, this is something that, for me, it's I'm learning every day as well, learning about the various aspect of various culture, uh, of the monk culture, and so on and so forth, right? And so, um, so I think that that's that's what we, uh, you know, for me, that's what I do. But this semester, one of my one of our colleagues uh, retired, uh, and uh, so they couldn't find anybody. So I'm back teaching American government. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, like, none of your students that is what is capable of teaching. Um... No, many. You know, it's kind of interesting. Many of the students, again, they're the young students, and so they don't know. Uh, they don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like, what, what What is going to happen when you are moved to another like stage of life, and who's going to yeah. do this? Um, your position, your role. Yeah, I, I think that you know again. Here's, here's what I came to the to uh, Concordia to do this to do this. Um, I was the director of housing policy and development for the city of Minneapolis, and so I was focusing on housing policies, focusing on affordable housing development in the city of Minneapolis. And you know the center concept in 1997 when I left the state council in Asian Pacific Minnesota to come here to Concordia, uh, the president of Concordia have had interest in doing something for the Hmong community. Kukulis have had long history of working with the Hmong people since the 80s, right? So he said, if we were to do something, what should it look like? And I said, you know, come, again, coming from Washington, D.C., I said, if we were to start a center, it should look like the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C., where you walk in and you learn about people, you know, their people, their history, their culture, their language, everything. And so I said, we should do something like that if we're going to do it. So I left Concordia here. I went to serve as president CEO of the Urban Coalition and then went to work for the city of Minneapolis. And, uh, and then I saw all the chatters uh, that uh, all the chatters between back then, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Sekau had the Yahoo group. <laughs> the so Yahoo News to. <laughs> discussion group, yeah, discussion group, and so I saw all the conversation going about the need for pre to preserve Hmong history, the need to teach Hmong history, culture. So I called the president of the university up and I said, Dr. Holt, I think it's time now to 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 start what we talked about in 1997. And so he said, Yeah, let, let me go talk to the fund uh, to the benefactor. So we had a person that had a million dollars. That wanted to give to start this thing. and so he said who would be the person that would be ideal to run this center so i said hey, dr gay lee because i mean lee at that time i mean he was a premier among scholars and you know many of the young people didn't haven't you know we didn't have all the other young scholars now like we do back then so i said dr gay lee 
And so I think that Dr. Gilly was one of the key candidates, but then he withdrew his application. And there were a lot of people that applied, a lot of important, uh, you know, great people that applied. Then the president and the benefactor said, we looked at all of those people. They're, they are purely academic or they're a purely community. And we need somebody that kept those the blend of the two, right? Because I worked here at Concordia before. And I worked in the community. And so we so need who somebody. Else, with, who else? Yeah. So, and we, then, then, then you. <laughs> yeah. And so he said, we, we, I think the person that we want is you, you know, because you understand higher education. You have a credibility in the community. And to start or something like this, we need the support of the community, right? So, but and he said, here's the final thing. He said, the search committee is going to appoint a white woman to run the center if you don't come. And I think that's what kind of motivated me, you know. And I said, wait a minute, you know, this is the first center for Hmong study in the world. In fact, the name center, Hmong study, I gave it a name. He said, what should we call this thing? I said, call it the center for Hmong studies. <laughs> so I gave it the name, and and so. Uh, it's kind of interesting. And, and so he said, you know, if the search committee was going to give it to another person if you don't come and, and not one person. And so, no, I, no. <laughs> yeah, and I said, you know, this is the first one in the world. And so I said, okay, you know, he said, what would it take to bring you to here, the Concordia again? And how much do you want, right? And so he said, your salary can be as high as my, uh, as the president, as mine, but you cannot go higher because the board won't allow that. So you can have the same salary as mine and uh, come. And I said, well, let me see the salary scale. So I picked middle. When I picked middle, he said, why you pick so low? I said, because I still need all the people above me to help me. <laughs> and I say, as long as I have enough to pay my bills a little bit to go play, that I'm fine with that. So I took a forty thousand dollar pay cut from the city of Minneapolis to come to hold this position here. And my my goal again is that hopefully in the future we will have a lot more Hmong scholars, right? That would be able to when I leave, they'd be able to fill this role. And I think I've confidence. Uh, um, how long? Have those yeah. How long has um, this um, Hmong program uh, like study that been running for now? Yeah, two thousand and four, two thousand and four, and then we launched our international conference in uh, in, in the minor Hmong studies in two thousand six. So we were we were supposed to host our eighth international conference of Hmong studies. Um, this past year, but because of the pandemic, we canceled. But one of the key thing is, again, uh, so when I came here, you know, uh, we started the minor and Hmong studies, we launched an international conference, because we need to know who, who's who among all of the Hmong scholars uh, throughout the world that are doing research. So the, 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 again, this is going back to, again, my political experiences in that many of our Hmong scholars could not present at international conferences sponsored by the Center for Lao Studies, Center for East Asian Studies, or Southeast Asian Studies, because in order to present at those international conferences, they, they say you must have published uh, in a scholarly journal and you must have presented at international conferences before in order for us to accept your paper for presentation. Plus, you have to do your research in those countries. Well, the problem is that most of our Hmong scholars are from the United States, are outside of Laos, right? Outside of Laos. And so they they would not be qualified to, they would not be accepted to present at these conferences. And so how can you have these criteria that you must have presented at international conference when you won't allow us to in, exactly. right? <laughs> and so I that's what I said, fine, we'll create our own international conference. <laughs> so that's how we launched our own international conference among studies. That was, that, that was a good role, a good model, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and so we did our own so that they would have experiences in presenting international conference. And secondly, we would publish the paper so they would have experience in publishing in paper as well. And as soon as we do the, we did this, you know, the, I think the other conferences realized that there is a uh, interest in this field. And so they start lifting the restrictions, particularly the Center for Lao Studies, then start lifting the restriction and say, okay, we will accept anybody as long as they're originally from Laos, not just in Laos. So I think that that's, you know, by, by doing that, we are actually putting a line in the sand to say that the field of Hmong studies is not a junior, uh, it's not a junior uh, field under East Asian studies 
or Southeast Asian studies or Asian American studies, but it's a field in itself and establishing that credibility and empowering our Hmong scholars. And so basically to say, you know what, we're going to help you and we're going to promote you. And uh, so that, you know, again, your picture promote your Hmong scholar into your promote that. We've seen that. It's, yeah, not, it's, it's, not other, it's, it's not any other program that, um, you know, at all more information that you, you know, you haven't actually um, shown to the public or you would like to show it? Because what I heard is that um, in your center, there's so much information in there that yeah, not yet to be classified. Yeah. Yeah. But one of the things is, and I, I think Dr. I, I want to thank Dr. Gail Lee for, for his guidance on this too. When he was here, I, you know, for me, when I came here, again, from the community, you have in the political arena, you have to collaborate, right? You need to collaborate in order to move forward. So when I came here, I said, I extended an invitation to the Hmong Culture Center. I extended an invitation to the Hmong Archive to say, why don't we co-locate? Because if you are a scholar and researcher, you don't care who owns that book. You want access to that book. <laughs> And so if we can somehow be co-located together, then instead of each of us buying that same book, we have three books, we just use the money to buy additional books, right? And so we only have one couple, couple uh, one copy, but we save enough money to buy two other copies from different copies coming in. And so that's what I wanted to do. And I said, okay, let's let's do all of this stuff. And um, and so the Mo Archive uh, under Tinning Vang you know, uh, accepted the invitation. They came here uh, and then they also, they left. But at the same time, Dr. Gilly was here. Dr. Gilly said, Li Pao, uh, even though Mo Arca have a lot of their materials here, the Center for Hmong Study doesn't have anything. Mm -hmm. And so why don't you uh, start collecting? Because one day Mo Arca is going to leave. And when they leave, you have nothing. You know, so I said, okay, that's a good idea. So would I the, went to the... But would you, the three of you, like the three organizations working together? Like sharing information? Yeah. yeah, somewhat yes and no, right? Because at the Center of Monsai, we're an academic institution. So we are an academic institution. We give out degrees, right? So everything that we collect here is for scholarly purposes, for research purposes. Uh, so it's basically academic purposes and research purposes and community and historical value, right? And so uh, for the two of them, they're, they're community-based institutions. So it's much more different. Oh, I but see. I still send people there when they come. <laughs> I say, well, you should check out the Hmong uh, archive. Go check out the Hmong uh, Culture Center as well. And so anyways, uh, a long story short, uh, I went to the state legislature and uh, Representative Sai Tao actually sponsored a bill. And we got some money to acquire stuff. And so ever since then, we've been... We've been acquiring things. And so what I look for are, again, historical and academic uh, uh, scholarly based material, right? So we have a large collection of books about monks. So you see all of the library. I know. Yeah. <laughs> so we have a lot of, uh, and then I started to collect. Uh, so that, and then next is photographs, right? So we have a lot of, uh, whoop, looks like my light died. <laughs> so we have a lot of, uh, uh, that that uh, have uh, that are old and they want to get rid and they don't know what to do with some of their collections that they have over years, right? Over the years. And so I've been able to secure uh, files and documents and as well as photographs from them, right? Mm -hmm. So here at the Center for Hmong Studies, we have the Lionel Rosenblatt collection, and Lionel Rosenblatt was the person that created the refugee program for the Southeast Asian uh, folks coming to the United States. Uh, and so his collection is here and lots of wonderful material. And then we have uh, Mac Thompson who ran the refugee program in Thailand. Mm -hmm. His whole collection is here as well. Wow. And so, so, and then Jerry Daniels collection is also here. So we have about 10 boxes of Jerry Daniels uh, things here. Uh, and then uh, people started to uh, send us uh, textiles. And so we started to have, you know, textile, monk textile, monk drink, so mm -hmm. I started collecting those as well because I think, you know, uh, textile changed over time, right? And so it used to be all hemp made and now it's all synthetic made. Some of them are now... Um, 
a machine made from Thailand. And so collecting those things for educational purpose, for teaching purposes. So we have many of those things, even the painting behind me. You know, that's a... Uh, yeah, that's uh, Tonghien. Is it Tonghien? <laughs> yeah, Tonghien. Yeah, this is uh, the battle in Tonghien. So uh, Mr. Jackie Gang painted that. We have four of the panels that he painted uh, that are here at the center. I would love to come here next time. I think when I'm down in Minnesota, I would love to come and, you know, sure. uh, around your, your center. This looks very really interesting. Absolutely. And a lot of the, you know, we have many, again, like I said, we have many... Um, unclassified documents here at the center have not been classified by the state uh, declassified by the state uh, mm. department or the CIA and uh, and then we have the Vent Lawrence collection that uh, Dr. Paul Hilmer got from Vent Lawrence Vent Lawrence was one of the person that original person that worked with Bill Lair um, in the old days and so uh, yeah can you share with us some of the um um, the pieces that you come into your surprise when you see that you thought, oh, that was just amazing, you know, a very valuable pieces. Yeah, I would say one of the, I would say the, the one that I, I, I think that is the most valuable is the one that contained the list of people to be evacuated from Long Gang. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that General Powell wrote and gave it to Jerry Daniel. Um, I'm guilty about this, but General Wong Pao, when he was still alive, we have that already. I didn't want to share with him because he might take it. <laughs> we can make so, a mini copy and give him one copy. <laughs> no. so, I ne- <laughs> so I never, because because that list is controversial, right? Controversial. So uh, that's why when we did the Min- We Are Mo Minnesota exhibit that we worked together with the Minnesota Historical Society along with, you know, uh, Noah Vang and Van Ming Mua. Uh, we debated, I debated whether to share that, but we decided to share that and uh, with the, at the exhibit. And even today when people come, you know, some of the colonels would come here uh, and I would show them the list. And the first thing they want to find out is, is my name on that list? Yeah, it's my name. It's my name. It's my name on that. Yeah, it was my name on that list, right? You know, and so uh, enough controversy in the community i don't want to share a lot of these things <laughs> to the community because you don't want you don't want division you know i want unity i know i know and so i think as for people like myself who collect these historical documents some are important to share some it's better to be to not share yeah, yeah. Uh, for the sake of uh for the, the unity, sake of the, the uh, unity, unity of the community <laughs> absolutely i mean there are, there are some things that uh, if I share, uh, people will be angry. <laughs> it would change the history. It would change the historical narrative. So how, how if you cannot share those information, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, like, how are you, what is the word, like, what's the point? Yeah, people, can, people can look at it. They just can't take pictures or make copies of it. <laughs> ah, so, okay. for, so for research value, for research purposes, right? So if they do it for, we're going to do it for research purposes. And then, you know, of course, they, they can come and take a look at it, but they can't make copy of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that because some of the donors specifically say that, state that they have, and so I think it's important to for us to honor uh, uh, the, the donor's <laughs> intent. Yeah, the donor's intent. Okay, from Hmong International Human Rights Watch, they gave us all of the material here. And so the, the refugees at Petrobon, they know who were deported back to Laos, you know, we have a whole box of uh, their material, some mm-hmm. of the petitions mm-hmm. that they uh, made to, to justify their resettlement in, in the third how do you, How do you get access to all those documents? A relationship. Try you know, I would say, <laughs> I think what, what, one of the, I think for, for people, you know, they, they, like for example, if you come here, it's like, I want, I want to, I want to see what you have. I say, no, you need to tell me specifically what you want, right? Because we have so many, right? We have so many. Just like the other day, I was posting on, on my Facebook feed that, you know, I have a file here, over 10,000 declassified documents from the Department of Defense. And so you said, I want to I see what you have. 
I haven't even looked at the 10,000 documents, I mean, 10,000 page documents. Uh, and so there are things in here that you have to be, people have to be specific about what they need so that I can take it out for them. Otherwise, you get lost in there. You can be here a whole year, you won't find what you're looking for, right? So how many people that you have working for you that um, you know do all these uh, yeah. findings, uh, sorting out? Yeah, I have some interns to, to help me. And so uh, some in student interns to help me. For example, we just acquired about uh, close to 600 uh, textile uh, and o other artifacts and from throughout, you know, Vietnam, China, Laos, and Thailand. So I've, I've been having my students intern take pictures of the hats, the you know, the, the women's collar uh, and the artifacts and then matching that with the uh, information and so it's it's tedious work. <laughs> it's tedious work. And so I had a, a, a student. Now he is the, on the school board, St. Paul School Board um, and Board of Education. He spent a whole summer with me to uh, catalog uh, Jerry Daniels and Lionel Rosenblatt's collection. And so make cop you know, we make copy, we scan them. But, you know, you still have to enter the information in, right? Same. What is this document about, right? And so you need people to type in, this document is about this, this document is about that. So I have, you know, um, lots of lots of goodies. Uh, yeah, that's right. So <laughs> where, where, do you, where do you store all this information? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, have a, we have a house here. You know, we occupy the house. And so uh, there's some in the basement, some here, and there's some off-site. Uh, and so... Uh, but yeah, we have a house here and uh, this house used to be the president of the university's house. So when we came, they gave us the house. And so we have lots of room. And that's why we do a lot of programming here at the center too. We do exhibit, major exhibits here. Okay. Well, so you have like, so you, you actually have, it's kind of like a center of your own, isn't it? Yeah. Um, it's not an office, it's a center. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a center itself. And, this and so is what we, so this is more like Professor Lee Bo Hyung's, um, um, you know, uh, office. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People come here, people say, you live here? I say, no, I don't live here. <laughs> if I live here, I'll be working 24 hours a day because there's so many fascinating stuff yeah, to be uh, uncovered. Like yeah. We could talk about this subject, you know, oh, hours and hours, but I think we're going to move yeah. on to something else. <laughs> Sure, sure. Now let's uh, touch a little bit about the uh, the more politic. Okay, the more politic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, share with us some um, just before we, we we go to the more politic in the US. Uh, mm -hmm. Share with us a little bit about your experience. I think you you were uh, chosen to go and work with the Clinton administration, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. Committee as the what advisor to the um, um, yeah. the president around about the um, um, Asian. It's an Asian. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, you know, one of the things is, you know, I've, I've always uh, been active. Uh, I was the chair of H and D, Mo National Development, and so I've done some policy work at the in Washington D.C. before. So um, I had the fortunate opportunity to be appointed by President Clinton to serve on the first ever President's Advisory Commission on Asian American and Pacific Islanders. So advising the president and federal agencies on issues affecting Asian, the 10 million plus Asian Americans in the United States, right? So I became, I was, became the first Hmong presidential appointees. And, uh, you know, again, uh, that's com coming back from my, my experience in working in the community uh, policy. One of the things that I pushed, really pushed for uh, during my term on the President's Commission was capacity building. You know, building the capacity of nonprofit organizations uh, to really access many of the resources at the Capitol in Washington, D.C., right? Uh, and also during that time, you know, the Hmong Naturalization Act, which basically allowed Hmong, people, Hmong veterans to, uh, to bring interpreter into the examination room, the citizenship examination room, to do interpretation for them. Uh, that bill was going through Congress. And I remember, you know, one morning the uh, White House calling me. I was in Washington, D.C. and said, the the, uh, the Mo Nationalization Act have reached the president's desk. 
what do you recommend that the president should do? Should he sign the bill or should he not sign the bill? And I said, well, he should sign the bill. Yeah, I said, well, he should sign the bill uh, because uh, just to honor the veterans. And plus, it's not even giving full right citizenship to Hmong veterans, right? Hmong and Lao veterans. Uh, and uh, it doesn't have any physical impact, meaning it doesn't cost anything. And so uh, in the so that's what my recommendation to the president, the president, and then the White House called back and said, uh, just to let you know the president uh, signed the bill. Right. And so those are things that I would say being present is important. Right. If you're not present, then I think it'd be very difficult. Uh, people won't think about you. Uh, and so the president, I know that, you know, again, uh, the United States of America is very concerned because they've been involved in so many uh, conflict throughout the world. To give something to one group means we have to do it to all, all the other groups, right? In fact, one of the congressional members said that to me. He said, Lipa, it would be great if we can give it to the Hmong, but you know what? If we give it to the Hmong, what about El Salvador? And what about all of the, in the Philippines, all of these groups you know, that we've been involved with? So we can't just give it to you. And my response was, well, they didn't ask, we did. We ask. So, <laughs> so give it to us. So I think. So I think being inside the, the system helps. Being present help, right? Mm -hmm. And if you don't, we don't have present. We don't. We don't. We're not there. Then I think it would be very difficult uh, for what, us to. You know, when you were on that, um, and what were some of the challenges that the Asians community having? You know, I think I think one of the major challenges again is that there were, there weren't any resources allocated for the Asian community. The Asian community felt that. I mean government and overall the feeling overall was that Asians don't need any help right so I think that's the major ones because we're we have the highest income you know and all of that blah 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 but the other I think for for me the biggest challenge is uh, being Southeast Asian right many of these conversations always revolve around those established Asian Chinese Korean Philippine, mm -hmm. Japanese, right? And so Southeast Asians are like being pushed aside. And so when you have limited resources, people fight for those resources. Uh, and I think that that's the, one of the big challenges. That's what I always say. Instead of fighting, let's look at building capacity, focusing on building capacity. When we talk about building capacity, then we build capacity within Southeast Asian organizations, along with well-established or, uh, organizations like Organization Chinese American, Japanese American mm -hmm. Sense League, and all of these, right? And so that that's that's where my focus was to say capacity building, Re without really saying let's focus on the Hmong only, right? Well, we need <laughs> yeah. So you have to you have to think you have to think from a larger perspective, right? So even when I was at the Asian Pacific Council, the State Council on Asian Pacific Mason, uh being the first Hmong director there. Uh, many of the you know Chinese and other groups and say, how come you're only focusing when we were working on immigration reform? And they say, how come you're only focusing on Hmong? I say, no, it's not just Hmong. Did you have an elderly mother and father in a nursing home? Because this immigration bill is going to say whether you are a citizen or not. If you're not a United States citizen, you won't get any federal benefits. And I say that impacts you. It impacts our community as well. So I think one of the important piece to working with a large group of people, different diverse group of people, is to find common ground, to find something that all of us, that all of us care about. Yeah. Otherwise, if you only focus on what your community care about, they're going to say, here's what my community care about. I'm not getting mine. <laughs> You're not getting yours, right? <laughs> so that's my experience in working in policy. That's why I say building exactly. relationship. Yeah, building so relationship where, and yeah. collaboration is important. So where where are we now in this conversation about the race, given that the horrible news that we hear, you know, been yeah. hearing around the world, right, about the violence to, towards Asia, you know, in social medias, uh, we mm -hmm. have so much. I, I, think, I think what's really important is for us to teach about history, right, true history, about this country, okay? So if you look at it, you know, there's many ma major issues that impact specifically targeted Asian uh, over the years, right? So you have like the major ones that you have, the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? 
the Chinese Exclusion Act, to Japanese internment camps, right? To even now the Muslim ban We're under President Trump, you know, banning Muslims from Muslim country coming here. Uh, and so we have to think from that larger perspective, right? And not just say it's only us. Uh, but one of the main things that I've, I've always, you know, talked about to other people is we want to make sure that our curriculum reflect our history and reflect the population. Because if you look at many of the curriculums that are developed for classroom, high school and elementary school, uh, those curriculums were written by white, talking from a white perspective. And white, and, and, and so it doesn't talk about the Hmong migration. It doesn't talk about the Japanese internment camp, how we rounded up all the Japanese during World War II and locked them up in concentration camp-like conditions. It doesn't talk about the fact that the Chinese built the Pacific Railroad here. And then when they reached the end of the line, that the, the, the white leaders didn't even include Chinese in the picture. <laughs> Purposely didn't include them, right? And so there's several series of law that were put in place. And so for me, you know, uh, for coming down, you know, from this perspective, I was teaching, you know, in, in uh, my American government class, I was teaching them talking about the civil rights movement, the Black Lives Movement that's happening right now, right? were uh, because of the George Floyd uh, death uh, by, by, you know, Der by Derek uh, Chauvin. And I said, you know, people think that after Dr. Martin Luther King died, that the civil rights movement ended. It did not end. It did not bring equality to people of color, right? To particularly to the African-American community. That's why the African-American community continued to voice, uh, you know, some, uh, their displeasure about these. And Hmong people, along with other communities of color, have benefited from the civil rights movement, you know, uh, from contract to hiring, you know, so we've benefited a great deal from that. Uh, and so how do you bring that in? And I brought in, you know, even uh, racial covenants. Uh, here in Minnesota, there are certain communities where you have a sizable white population, but no people of color. That's because in the land deed, it talked about the fact that these properties cannot be sold to people of color. So wow. some of those policies are still in place. And uh, so <clears throat> teaching, you know, making sure that college and high schools have people that look like me. That would teach so a class for so white students. So you <laughs> we, we need more education, isn't it? Um, yeah, or, we, 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 need to be, we need to be intentional about including our history in history books. Mm -hmm. uh, and otherwise, most of the people who are putting this history book together are still predominantly white. Mm -hmm. So we still talk about the fact that Christopher Columbus Christ discovered America. Mm -hmm. It still paints the picture that, you know, the Native Americans are um, savages. <laughs> yeah, they're savages, right? And they're bad people. The Native Americans were just protecting their land. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, bringing that context to, to what's happening to, you know, all the Asian hate, you know, again, in order for us to prevent these type of things from happening in the future, we have to be intentional about including our history in history books that are being taught in high school and that are being taught yeah. Yeah. in college. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and then be intentional about hiring people that look like me, people that look like you, people that look like African American community to be in the classroom to teach these classes. Because I think, you know, without, if they didn't hire, if, if I wasn't asked to teach American government, I don't think that, you know, I don't know whether my colleagues would be teaching about racial covenant, whether they'll be teaching about civil rights. So we some need of the, more, more of the different color, color people, of people, nationality to get involved into the, the mainstream, isn't it? Now, yeah, but, but, but one of the things that I wanted to also touch on this is, is that, <clears throat> you know, I, I was telling uh, people that, in the 80s, when the Hmong first arrived in Minnesota, we were called all kinds of names. We were called chinks, goops, jabs, go back to your country. Our elders were being beat up like right now, the elders are being beat in Chinatown, in the San Francisco or Los Angeles or in, in New York, right? So our elders were the were those victims back then. Mm -hmm. And so now people are saying, wait a minute, how 
all these things that happened. I said, wait a minute, that's back then. It's still, it happened to us back then. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand from that perspective, right? And then from that perspective. So that's what I said. The way to change it is to change the narrative, to change the curriculum, Mm -hmm. to change the people teaching the history so that you can have a different perspective and not just an all white perspective. That's great. Now, um, that's very interesting. Now, um, we can move to, um, like I said, a little bit about the more politic in the U.S. Um, I can see that now we have more young people is an emergence into the various positions in the governments or in the public life in the U.S.A., right? And this is, this is it's on the back of my mind, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is my curiosity question, right? Are those political more, right, consult to you at all? Uh, <clears throat> some of them don't even know me. <laughs> I think some of them don't even know me. So uh, you you are already the expert on that. That's why I thought that I have to consult you. You know, we have the best, best, well, the best and most knowledge and your knowledge um, um, person in in our like in our community. Have they yeah. come to you for advice? Yeah, no, not not many. And I think that you know one of the thing is. Um, some of the older ones that, you know, I've been active. Back then, I've been very active. I was saying that, you know, I was telling uh, one of the state legislature, uh, Hmong state legislature, I said, you know, back then, I was uh, the Asian representative for President Clinton and for Clinton's campaign in Minnesota. Mm-hmm. And then during the Obama campaign, I was the uh, Asian representative for, uh, for the A- Obama leadership team, Asian leadership team uh, for... Um, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Michigan, right? And so I was telling them that I said, you know, we were very involved and very active. I was very active in in Obama campaign as well. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've worked on many campaigns and they didn't know, you know. And so for me, I don't like bragging either. So. <laughs> but people, even, um, no, um, people, even me, I'm living the other side of the, the country, right? the, other, the world, the other side yeah. of the world. I still know you, but... People yeah. on your doorstep don't know you and don't come for the advice. This is what I'm. This is just you know yeah. how what what what's happening. Well, well, I think that I think nowadays you know uh, some of these young people are very capable. They're very capable. They experience. They're very experienced. They also know the system very well. You know, and they know how to work the sure? system. How to how to run campaign. But one of the things that I think that what's missing. They're not as connected to the community as they should be. I think that's the other piece, right? Uh, but when you think about, again, they're growing up in an individualistic society. Uh, and so the thinking is very much themselves, right? Very much themselves or, or issue oriented. But we, you know, we in Minnesota, we've had some you know, people that do some good legislation out there. Uh, and they're, they're also very effective in challenging the established institutions. So I think this generation is very different, you know, very different uh, from our generation. So I'm just glad that they're, you know, that they have the courage and the motivation and the interest to to run for office. It's better that we have somebody in office than none. <laughs> because back then, again, back then when I was working at the Capitol, I, I was the only Hmong person at the Capitol. So now it's good to see um, yeah. Representative, you know, Representative uh, Fu Li, uh, Samantha Vang, Representative Samantha Vang, you know, and and so on and so forth at the Capitol. So, but do do you think that um, you know, in order to be successful, we have to have our fo- our foundation right? Have to be a little bit stronger than this. Yeah. So I, I, on the 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 top. Yeah, I, I think that you know, again, I think it's it's also lacking of leadership in the community, right? And so leadership in the community, I, let me put it this way. I, there, there's different type of leaders, right? There's the media appointed leaders. These are, these are the people that whenever something happens in the community, the media would call them and ask for their opinions. And the media would say, we spoke to Lee Pao, the leader of the Hmong community, right? <laughs> and then you have the self-appointed leaders and the self-appointed leaders are people that go out there and say, I'm the leader of the Hmong community, right? And they may not be, they may be, but they claim, proclaim to be the leader. Which then, is a lot of them, though. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of them. <laughs> a lot of them, unfortunately. And the other one would be, you know, uh, uh, positional leaders. 
they are leaders because of their position. So if you look at, you know, many of the legislators who left, Hmong legislators or Hmong elected officials that left their positions, they're gone. You know, they don't connect to the community at all. So I see that, you know, position, those are positional leaders. But then there's also the natural leaders, right? Natural leaders. So if you think about the natural leaders, you're thinking about General Powell. Right, he he was a positional leader. He was there serving, but when he left his role, he still continued to be involved in in the community. People like uh, President Jimmy Carter, when he left his presidency, he continued to do great things in the community, be a key leader in the community. So, how do we help many of these people transition to become natural leaders? But in order to become natural leaders, you have to win the trust of the community. You have to be able to demonstrate that you can do that you've done something for the community, right? And so people still remember that. People remember that. And so I, I see that, you know, like, you know, Senator Fong Ho being uh, at the Capitol, he's done great things for the community. And he's able to bring the community along and he sponsored many legislations that benefit the community directly. So uh, I, I I would say that, you know, maybe after he retires, you know, he will continue to be engaged and involved in the community. And so what we need to do is that we need we, we haven't developed a mechanism where uh, we screen out people, right? And uh, said, okay, these are the values of the community. These are the concerns of the community. And we're going to evaluate your candidacy based on these things. And if you meet all of these criteria, we will work with you and we will support you. We will fund you. We will campaign for you. We don't have that infrastructure in place to do that. And so I see that many of the people run. I, I Excuse me for all the people that ran successfully. I said, they're accidental candidates in that they have the knowledge, skill, and ability, and they, say, and they feel passionate about an issue, and they just run. They just run, right? And whether you support them or not, they just run, okay? Because they think that they have something to contribute, which is nothing wrong with that. But then we have to look at the other side to say, okay, how do we uh, develop a mode, right, and mentor and guide people that once they're in office, that they have the best interests of the community in mind and not the not their own interests, right? And so I think that that's that's the infra, that's the next infrastructure that we need to do. And I, you know, Dr. Paul, uh, I know I've, I've heard me talk about this. Deng Lee and I we talked about this before about a um, exploring the possibility of, you know, I, I now I call it the uh, committee of one hundred, right? So this is when I worked in. Washington, D.C., uh, and um, I've learned about this Committee of 100. The Chinese have a Committee of 100 of people who are very influential, people who are uh, uh, er uh, ethically and morally uh, good individual. Uh, they're very influential in the community. They have wealth. They serve on this committee. And whenever this committee hosts functions, the president shows up. All the cabinet level shows up for these functions, right? And so maybe what we need to do is we need to create a committee of 100, selected 100 individuals that can contribute. And so we will be able to screen people, right, for camp for offices. We will be able to place people in key positions in Congress, right? So, key positions so, in yeah. yeah. So are we are we in in the process of setting up this uh, 100? Um, we're having we have a couple conversation though we have a couple conversation already, but you know I I've hesitated to launch it yet because right now with the death of General Wang Pao, right, people are still fighting to replace him. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's I think that's um you probably know me that I'm gonna ask you. Yeah, question would be you know like because you were you were in someone in there right, looking at I think you know so many young you know uh, scholars and leaders mm -hmm. around the country right. Do you think that would there be any ones that would have the <clears throat> ability to um, at least, you know, step into um, General Pound's uh, shoes? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, having um, been with, with General Wang Pao uh, for many functions, right, and being in his hotel room, I, I think this generation would be difficult to find someone, you know, because you notice, you know, when I was with General Wang Pao, even at 12 o'clock in midnight, people are still calling him. People are still visiting him. While he's eating, people are calling from all over the place to talk to him, to meet with him. And I think that, 
young people nowadays, they value their privacy, right? They value their privacy. So I think it'll be very difficult to find somebody like General Wang Pao. So that's, I always tell people, I don't think that we can replace General Wang Pao. General Wang Pao, it's a man, he's a man of his own, right? Uh, we can never replace him. But how do you, you know, develop a, a, uh, a new leadership style and new leadership criteria, right? And the way moving forward may be that, you know, um, that we have people that are leaders of causes, right? Mm -hmm. Leader of causes. And so with Asian hate here, the attacks on maybe in the future, there may be attacks on Hmong people that someone will, uh, I think in the future, I think you will have causal leaders, right? Leaders who will advocate and fight for causes, right? Mm -hmm. And when that cause is done, then they go back to being a part of the community mm -hmm. and normal. And so I think that that may be the trend for us in moving forward. And we have people that are very passionate about that. Like, for example, you know, I always tell people that, you know, if you look at how did Senator Fong He uh, get inspired to run for public office? Senator Fong He was very active in this movement to force a uh, radio station here, KQRS, to apologize to the Hmong community for making derogatory comments against the Hmong. Mm -hmm. And so after that, he launched a campaign. He ran for office, right? And, uh, and then Council Member Dai Tao, uh, how did he become a council member? Well, he was very active in fighting against a uh, uh, the city of Minneapolis about, in, about injustice and also KDWB, who also made um, racist comments against the Hmong people. And so from that, movement we have council member Dai Tao okay <laughs> so and then uh, council member Nelsi Yang on the east side of St. Paul I see it you know he was she was very active very involved in trying to get a uh, uh, safety walking light uh, right across from Hmong village because people were crossing there it was too dangerous so she was working really hard to get the city to install uh, stop lights there so to allow people to cross the street she ran for office and she now she's a city That's council awesome. member, right? So I think that it's 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 one of those it's it's causal leaders that we will probably have. But to have somebody to say, This this the Hmong, you know, the Hmong yeah. leader, it might be difficult. It might be difficult. Yeah. Now I guess that um because we've been in uh, um the Western world for forty five years now. And <laughs> it's our dream, um, well, our whole dream anyway, you know. To have a more person sitting at the federal congress in the USA, yeah. who do you think that person will be? I, I think that if we have, you know, we have had a couple of people in uh, California that ran for congressional seats, right, and uh, they were unsuccessful. Right? So if you look at some of the people who are here in the Twin Cities or or who wherever they are in the United States. They get elected from uh, districts where it's at large position or a district where you have a sizable Hmong population. So I think that what, in order to move beyond that, they have to tackle issues that impacts all people in their district and not just their, you know, not just the, the Hmong. Uh, it, you don't want to be pegged as a Hmong candidate. And that's what I advised um, a couple of people that ran for office before. I say no. You don't want to be pegged as a as a Hmong candidate. Okay, you want to you want to talk about issues. Talk about issues of affordable housing. People don't have in, enough housing to live in the community that they grew up in because it's so expensive. Talk about public safety. Everybody is concerned about their public safety. <laughs> talk about those major issues. Affordable health care, right? Affordable health care. Quality education, you know, in the political world, we call it these are the main four issues that uh, resonate well with everybody. They're with everybody, everybody, right? And so you may use examples from the Hmong community, but don't be a Hmong candidate, right? And so if I were to run for office, I wouldn't host my launching um, campaign uh, announcement at Hmong Village. I would not do that because I would be a Hmong candidate. And now Hmong people will say, well, you're going to only represent the Hmong mm. people, right? That's and so I think that we have to really craft the message really well. And this is based on my, again, from my political experiences. And I, I you, told people. Are, are <laughs> you, I think, are you interested in running? You know, I thought about it. 
you know, I, 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 you would be a, a good, I think a very successful candidate to, to, you know, Yes. at the uh, Congress. <laughs> well, thank you. I think that, you know, again, you have to, you have, you have to tackle issues that, that are large, right? You have to tackle issues that uh, would be uh, at the federal level issue, right? Um, and so a lot of our candidates are at the city level, our candidates are at the state level only. And maybe, you know, in the future, we may have one. I mean, we have Shello who ran uh, against um, Congresswoman Ben McCollum and uh, my, as a Republican against a Democrat. And I said, this is a Democratic uh, district. There's no way you can be. Secondly, uh, secondly, she's a woman. And so there's a woman caucus uh, that's made up of both Republicans as well as Democrats, uh, women. And as long as they're a women candidate, they support those uh, that particular individual, so it would be very difficult to to run against her, and he lost. I mean, that those, those, those are things that I think we have to uh, we have to be conscious. We have to know, right? Mm-hmm. I think we have to know the political climate, yeah. Uh, yeah. and and the political the, in the climate and environment uh, to before we do anything. I guess my question is that would you be interesting to um, to run for the Congress in the USA? Yeah, yeah, that that would be my interest. That that would be my interest. But I, timing is so. Uh, all right. So we will race in there. So I think your interest, but maybe the timing is not right at the moment. Yeah, timing is not right, and I think I it's uh, maybe twelve months. At, yeah, paying attention to uh, to what's happening. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, I also tell people that you know, I, I am also very effective in not being in office. I've been effective in getting policies and getting resources from Congress, uh, from, from the state legislature. So you don't have to be there, <laughs> you know, to, to, to have influence. As long as you know the system, how to work the system, right? Okay, to see yeah. yeah we system. are going to, um, um, as the time, I think I look at the time, wow, I'll... Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm going to probably touch a little bit about your family, you know, because like mm-hmm. I think like when um when I was talking to you and you say one of your mentor Jim Wright, okay, the city of mm-hmm. um, the city manager of Minneapolis once said to you that um never forget your family, their love for yeah. you, job come and goes, but family mm-hmm. will you know stay with you forever, and yeah. I know that I know that every successful man there is always <clears throat> a commit. Uh, commit, uh, committed, oh, yeah. uh, dedicated wife behind. Mm-hmm. So, um, can you share a little bit about the lady behind your success? Yeah, <laughs> I think my, I think she's always been very supportive, right? And so I try to not to. I always say they have their chisaka lipo, they odunaya nilipo, because they have their own, they have their own personality, right? They have their own personality, their own way of achieving their own fame. And so don't want to connect them to me. I always tell that. And, but, but and, then, I said, I mean, and, and like, it, it's fair enough, but you know, like a lot of the hard work gone, you know, unnoticed. And then as a wife, I'm, I'm a wife myself, right? We, we don't get any credit, any uh, recognition at oh, all. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah. I, I would say, I mean, just like in the Bible, right? In the Bible, they said, you know, you, um, uh, okay, and this is what I tell young people too. I mean, you're out there and you think that you're, you're, you are high and mighty. And so as a husband, active, kept the castle intact. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so share, we all, share with us a little bit of um, you know, the, the lady behind your success. Yeah, yeah. So I think that, you know, my wife, you know, my wife, you know, well, my Liana, yeah. Okay, I did not say Munka, like a Munka. And uh, so, uh, 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 again, she, she's been, you know, she's been very supportive. Which is very supportive. Which is very supportive. <laughs> um, do you do you remember when I was young uh, the, um, that story about um, to see it or not? What are you shooting? You know how? Um, yeah, you didn't know how. You didn't know how. Yeah, yeah. They got 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 they
women in a domestic role, right? I think all of us have each each of us have a role to play, right? And so if she has a function at her place, go, you know, at her workplace, go, right? To support her because she also accompany you to your functions. Yeah. And so it's very important to to also support each other in that role. And the foundation is from the home, right? If you don't have a solid foundation from the home, you won't go far, right? And so, yeah, you know, the, to to you to pan in yeah she greet la she interact the la yeah she interact the la she greet the la then that like no yeah the oh and the you know pan in she made on a bit more new one now what you la you start na yeah because then what they make some more na yeah so I'm like what they the value of be to the right person right hand right be to right hand person yeah the wife right. Uh, the wife's right hand person, and you should, you should go to man dinner. <laughs> it's got to be that way too. And so, see as a partner, about the new partnership, man. Okay, the partnership. So how, how, how are you two men? Huh? How do you two meet? In, in, oh, Shinji, uh... <laughs> introduce us. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so they introduce us, and uh, I, I, I like the way she talks, she likes the way I talk. And also with similar interests, similar dreams, yeah. Okay, similar vision. And uh, that's, it, it fit. There's also negative. I'm I'm always hot all the time. She's cold all the time. <laughs> and, I, and I think it's important for, you know. Yeah, yeah, Linda, yeah, Linda, for example, that when I go give speech, right? Sometimes she goes to me to give speech. I, I give a speech and come back and she said, well, go ahead later on. She's like, go ahead and go ahead and go ahead and go ahead and go ahead. And so that's where she tell you, okay? And they're all going to get up to peak on and it doesn't look good on you. Or you, what you said here was not appropriate. You shouldn't have said that. Mm-hmm. And so you refine and you fix it and you become better. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I say. The partnership is is that, right? Mm-hmm. You got to have that. Because she calls, she buys. She told him to down there. He must come down there. Like he should tell you there. He should tell you now. He must tell you. Or he must come down there. Like for example, at home, you know, I cook. I love. I cook. I clean. I, I, the floor, I mop the floor. I clean the bathrooms. <laughs> so in another way, <laughs> because she's also because she also works, right? You can't expect. But she says, "Ah, dear, you have to sit in your chair." It's too low for you to sweep the floor. It's too low for you to mop the floor. It's too low for you to clean the toilet. Too low for you to cook, you know. I do all of that. They go that and that. You know, I'm a better cook than her. She is. bring up this subject. you know, you know, you know, um, should I, should I say it? And you know, uh, wow, you know, um, Professor Lee Bosch, you know, you know, holy shit, the bona ya. You know, you know, you know. <laughs> I do. I, I, yeah, I, I just bought a mop so I can mop the floor. <laughs> the old mop is broken. <laughs> so, we only know that me and dad, we tell me, and dad, don't let her, we tell me, and don't let her. I do all of this stuff, you know, and I think that. It's nothing wrong with that, right? To Pinyolo society, on and on, you need, you know, two income to survive, right? Okay, because she buys it, then I get the money. But I just share, I just get the job, right? Because I just share, I buy the house, right? It's not right, right? So for me, again, um, I do all the, I I do king cleaning, wash dishes, I do it. Well, no, how like we, well, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, like I tell her. You know, think about it. Don't do that. Cook if you if you cook, you go now how are y'all? And you put love into it, it tastes much better. <laughs> if you just do it just because you have to do it, it won't taste good. And so, <laughs> so I cook because I love cooking, and I, I cook because I want to cook so good that you to cool up all the oh go now cook y'all how are y'all? Yeah, and then you cook for yeah. the love that that's different. 
Hey, you talk for me. Then you just cook good to the food. Then I. She's like very nice person. I'm. I'm. Um. I hope that one day I will. I will meet her. Oh, you will. Oh, you will. You will. You know. To, you know. This person. Now that I go there, I come and visit me. Yeah. Visit the house. I see. Yeah. And um, you don't talk much about your children as well. You know, like the other day, I didn't know that you have six kids. I thought yeah. that. Amazing, you know, <laughs> students. And like I told you, I only have, th- I only have three, and I was, I'm struggling. <laughs> <laughs> I always tell people that you see the white hair, the blow down on that from raising kids, right? Waking up in the middle of the night. <laughs> so what age are they now? Are they old um, in the teenager? Yeah, you want jaw jaw all the way old. I want to learn young child. Yeah, I have, uh, I have one that's uh, three years old, right? Oh, really? Three years old. Yeah, and then one that's really old up here as well, <laughs> the 20s. And so my daughter is, um, uh, she's married, uh, she's married, but she's also hard of hearing. And so she's deaf, hard of hearing. So um, I learned a lot from her. I learned a lot of things from her. So she's married, I get that. Then I have a, 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 the next one, a student at the University of Minnesota. He's got his own mind. He does his own thing. He's a... Mm-hmm. a a outdoors person, and then I have a uh, uh, Christian who's uh, in his second year in college, and so here as well. And then uh, the younger kids, Motu Nyo, Rip Lao, Rip all the other shit. Young. Yeah, Missy. Share with us some of your parenting skills, because you talk a little bit about share with us some of your parenting skills, how to raise successful kids and your children. Oh, I, I think that. You know, I think my, my kids, whatever I do, like with y'all, with pay to all the kids and y'all. Kung nyo, kung uo hao le hao lu center, and all that, kung yi involved la jona. You know, during the conference, I involve them uh, to come and help me organize the conference. Mm-hmm. I go to rally, I take them with me, you know, so get them involved in the community. Can can like, uh, like, bow, like develop their own identity, their own passion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like for example, I get lectured by, you know, even though I'm, I'm involved in a lot of social justice activities, I still get lectured by my kids about social justice issue. <laughs> oh, do I, I do that too. Yeah, I, I got that from my kids as well. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling I should be teaching you, but you're teaching me. Yeah, so that's fine. Uh, so, I think a lot of you are not echo. You more Take you set boundary. Take a check a point. You know what I mean. You want to yeah. And I think the kids um, need to know what are you doing in your your role in the community. Yeah. I think that that that's uh, very important. So um, they can kind of you know get into the community and they know your vice versa in that way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, they look like with the kids very active, involved the whole. Like the exhibit that we installed here, I have all my kids involved and help me set it up. You know, doing some digitizing here. I've I have my son helping me doing the digitize here as well, taking photographs of some of the artifacts. And so get them involved and they, they get to meet with people. Uh, and uh, I think that that's important. Each of them is involved in the community. And uh, so, when you move to Haiti, you know, we'll take after you. We'll take after this center. <laughs> you know, one, one of my son, one of my sons said, Dad, when I, when I have my career, I want to be like you, you know, I want to do what you do. And I say, well, that's good. Here's what you need to do to get here. <laughs> you know, be involved in the community. So uh, I think that's, you know, that's one of the things that. Do you, like, yeah, that, yeah. Do, do, do you feel that, um, you know, our children are the reflection of us as a parents? Uh, yeah, I think to some extent, they love they look at us, right? And that's like, I have a friend, daughters, and she and you know what? Uh, research has shown that uh, daughters, uh, involved with your daughter, nah, then they're going to be engaged, involved in uh, uh, abusive relationship. They may find a person that, you know, uh, that may be uh, abusive, you know, uh, for them. But your daughter will look up to you, right? And so you need to be involved in much more actively involved in their, in your daughter's life. Yeah. 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 (laughs) So for me, you know, at home, you know, again, I'm, I'm modeling for my kids. I'm modeling for my kids, you know, that I cook, that I do the dishes, 
that I clean. And so I think I grew, family yeah. to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. So I grew up, you know, I grew, I have seven brothers, no sisters. Right. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I have an older brother had, uh, that's older than me. Uh, and uh, my mom and my dad taught us that it is, you know, Time to cook, time to clean, right? Mm -hmm. And so, okay? yeah. so that's like, well, they, I grew up in that environment, right? Where I cook, I clean, I do everything. And so because of that, and I see my dad doing that, right? Mm -hmm. I see my dad doing that as well. Uh, so I say, I'm going to be like that. And I think I want, that's how we model for our children. And the two people are there, hello, 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 it doesn't matter, you know, they, they might go and, you know, did something that, you know, mm -hmm. off the track, but somehow, you know, they'll find a way back to the track on, you know, on track. Yeah. In. That's yeah. how I believe. Yeah. I mean, that's why as parents, we have to be role model for our kids. Mm -hmm. We have to model behaviors for them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was telling my brother that, you know, your son's, you know, small, do all these hand gestures. Right? She don't, you're laughing now, but wait until he goes to school and he does those hand gestures, yeah. the teacher's going to so, call you. <laughs> anyway, so, no, yeah, that, that, that's true. So uh, the, the parents have to be a good role model to, to the, absolutely. the children, right? Yeah, the they don't generation, and we have to do that. We have to yeah. do that because we're competing against uh, negative things on television, movies. Exactly, yeah. Right? yeah. So we have to compete against that. And so we have to be more intentional yeah. about being good parents for them. Now, going a little bit on, touch a little bit on your hobby, your hobby, your photography and martial art. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how yeah. do those two <laughs> come into your love, life? How do you get involved with those two? Yeah, I just love taking pictures, you know, and I think I got that from my, you know, my brother who was, uh, he took a couple um photography classes when he was in college, you know, and uh, he's always showing me all this. So, but I started taking up, I, you know, I bought a camera and start taking pictures. And my work here at the center, it's about documenting. So I've documented rallies, I documented events and all that. And so uh, I love doing that, taking pictures of flowers, you know, natures. I, I enjoy doing that. Um, you know and so what, can I ask, can I do something, you know? A lot of your leaders, they, they love taking pictures of flowers. I, what, why is that? Peaceful, peaceful. <laughs> <laughs> ah, peaceful, to be nature, peaceful. I think beauty is important, right? And so I love taking a picture of that. Um, and then my martial arts background, you know, growing up in uh, public housing in the early 80s. You so know, it's more like self-defense. Yeah, for self-defense. So Kidur and Taupek, you know, we've been beat up. We were beat up by both black and white. I've uh, been spat on. I've been spat on. I've been beat up. And so one day I decided, you know what? Nobody's going to ever do that ever to me again. So I just I enrolled in martial art classes, and I've been doing that for 30 years now. Um, and so uh, it's all part of the Shima. You know, once you, once you learn it, you develop patience. Mm -hmm. you know, and you also have courage when you walk, you go somewhere you're aware of your surroundings mm -hmm. right? and so you're much more confident so you build confidence also build patience uh, and uh, I've had people call me you know, like that doesn't hurt me, I know I can beat you up I'll just walk away because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think I was reading somewhere and you, you said that um, um, you know, the principle that you learned, right, during your martial art lesson, right, it have helped you up until today. So probably like the yeah. patience, you know, you had to ocean days, the kind of stuff, right? And yeah. um, uh, autonomy, like that, that kind, yeah. Yeah, I think in, in protecting yourself, protecting your family, and protecting your community, right? Yeah. And my martial art pa um, master, yeah, uh, Dr. Salong Yana, Sir Salong Yana. Okay. And, yeah, Sir Salong Yana. And back then when, we were, when I was in high school when I started martial arts, and uh, we, uh, 
after class so like from seven o'clock till eight o'clock uh, or you know from six o'clock till eight o'clock and then after we would go to the house and we would talk about history we would talk about I mean all of that stuff you talk about the importance of education so I was just telling him the other day that motivation think of our passion think of our passion so it comes up, yeah. Develop uh-huh. early, develop early, you know, and I still have a folder mm-hmm. of newspaper clippings from the 80s uh, whenever they write about Hmong. I mm-hmm. collect that because he encouraged us to do that. So, you he, know, so he, would, in another way, he probably instill, you know, instill the the seed of, you know, um, in you in that early years that, you know, you need to go yeah. to your, you know, heritage of your culture. Yeah, absolutely. The importance of history, mm-hmm. the importance of preservation of the culture, and yeah. Uh, the, 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 the love for the people, the mm-hmm. okay. So, uh, okay. So usually you pick that up and I think that that's always been, you know, part of me. Back of your mind. Uh, see. Yeah. Back yeah, mind. yeah. Wow. I think we have uh, come to almost an end now. When will you see, yeah. when will we see you in Australia? I would love to come over. I, 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 I watch a lot of, uh, videos about Australia. <laughs> the bad countries, but the snake. I don't like the snake. <laughs> Kangaroo, the koala. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> black manga, mamba, and all that. But I th- yeah, I would love to uh, visit one day uh, Australia. One day, uh, yeah, Australia, I, I have not. One year, I had I was selected to go to Austria mm-hmm. uh, on on a leadership a fellowship and. I was so excited. I thought it was I was going to Australia. Australia but it's Australia. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think you know you you have visited uh, most of the country where you know and in um, they have more people live. Yeah. But I think Australia is probably the the one that I, we always say that we are the forgotten <laughs> mom because. <laughs> <laughs> we are we are so far away, so remote. You know, we we are yeah. not. Um, you know, you know, we are in the islands, so people forget mm-hmm. about us. <laughs> yeah, I think Australia is a beautiful country. Heard about the uh, Hmong people growing vegetables in Tasmania. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that as well. So I read about that. I saw one of the places I like to visit one day. You know, Australia, uh, also uh, French Guiana. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's right. Yeah, well, we yeah. hope that you, you know, you and have, you know, well, put in your probably put in your planner for the next couple of years. You know, bring your families to come over to see us. Now, sure. I'm going to wind up, and then um, I think my ending. Oh, just before I do that, is there anything that you um you want to add, or you want to um you know um, share with us that you know hope that it will benefit the younger generation? Um, oh no, I think. think that- yeah, I, I think that I wanted to leave by saying, first of all, thanking you for um, listening to me for almost an hour and a half, almost two hours. <laughs> it's listening to my stories and your interest in hearing about the work that I do. Uh, the other thing is I wanted to um, uh, encourage young people you know, to, to learn the history, to understand the culture, and to learn the language, right? Because like I said you know, to my students here, uh, language is key to our history and to our identity, right? Because uh, many of our history uh, are embedded in some of the uh, cultural ceremonial chants that they could see it in the. So if you don't know the language, you don't know how to read and write, you don't speak the language, you will not be able to dwell down into some of those cultural ceremonial chants, mm-hmm. the lyrics. And by not doing that, then you won't know uh, your identity, right? And so the language So that's a compound word that's that that's the word for education in the moment, right? And so a lot of these things are embedded in our language, our history, our identity are embedded in our cultural ceremonies. So don't forget who you are uh, and uh, continue to learn the language, continue to learn the history, Continue to learn the culture. Yeah, but you fall in that. Yeah, but you just need to more soul, more plea. Okay, but you more plea. I 
Yeah, so I see my work here as, you know, working with the younger generation. We have a, you know, strong and uh, history, a long history in China. Very rich, it's and, a very rich history. Uh, very rich history all the way down to okay. And if you look at many of our fathers and grandfathers, they were children. They were 13, 14, 15 years old. And they took up arms and went into the jungle to fight, to protect their village, to protect their families, and to, to protect their country. And uh, so it's important to not forget those things. Uh, so I would, that's, that's what I would leave for young people. Thank you very much. And this Thank is my you. ending question. What is Professor Lee Bo Hyung's mission um, statement in life? <laughs> my mission statement in life. Huh? <laughs> I would say my mission would be, you know, to use what God gave me, right, to help those who I am able to help using the resources that I have. Mm-hmm.